Okay, great. Um, all right. So uh, we're up to, are we up to number 15 here on the, the uh, P30 OPAR webinar series? And I personally am really excited about, about this webinar because we're going to learn about, and I love the title, uh, Greg and Shaunak, you guys are genius with titles. So, uh, uh, so we're going to go to Jupyter today and learn how to use Jupyter Notebooks for data analysis and workflows. And um, Shaunak and, and Greg are the perfect people to, to take us on this tour. Um, Shaunak is the Director of Biostatistics at UTHSC. He joined us from UCSF uh, several years ago, um, more than several at this point. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, when does several become uh, more than several? I don't know, at five or six, I think. Um, and he is a card-carrying statistical geneticist, as well as being just a damn good statistician. Um, and Greg has been working with Seanock now for a couple of years. Um, Greg and I met quite a few years ago. I don't know when it was exactly, Greg, but... Um, uh, the, Greg and Seanock have been teaching a number of classes in R and uh, to the best of my knowledge, this is maybe the first presentation, at least in this particular style, uh, on Jupyter Notebooks. So um, take, take it away. All right. You want to say something, Sean? No, uh, take well, you know, Gregory, uh, you know, Gregory is, uh, is a uh, is an electrical engineer by training um, and uh, joined our group a few years ago. He's, uh, you know, always uh, interested in trying new things and has been a leader for our group in getting us uh, to try different things, new things. And yeah, over to you, Gregory. Look forward um, to what you have to say. All right. Thank you. I will start to share my screen. All right, so um, hello everyone. So uh, today we'll try to land on Jupiter uh, and uh, we will uh, we'll have a, a little tour uh, about interactive notebooks using Jupiter. So I will present uh, with uh, Shonak like uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, the, in the, the outline we'll cover, like we'll explain like what are the Jupiter notebooks? Uh, we will explain also what are the Jupyter kernel, which is like a key concept like using uh, Jupyter. Uh, we will show you like how to create and export a notebook. And uh, Shonak will make uh, uh, some demonstration how like possible use like for Jupyter notebook. And I will finish by uh, showing you like how to install and uh, talk to you a little bit more about like uh, the Jupyter kernels. So uh, I will start by first like an example. So let's say that uh, you did an experiment, you collected your data and uh, you program uh, a code to do the analysis. You did it like on R, on Python, any language and uh, you have your results and now it's time to share, uh, to share your, uh, your work. So of course you will share your output, you will share a visual, you will share your analysis, your interpretation, but you want also to share your code. You want to share your code for transparency and maybe because you have a, a special like methodology or optimization in your code that is important also for you to, to share. So the way like to share your code Basically, you have like for your programming work, you have like two options. You have like to share your raw uh, source code, and you have uh, the way like where you can compile, make an executable where basically you will push a button and you will get the output. So let's say that you share your raw source code. So if you share it with a collaborator that are also programmers and they know the language, so probably like. The, the way they will see your, uh, your code will be something similar to this. They can read it, they can assess it, it can be very, very clear, and uh, they can appreciate your, uh, your work and how it works. Now, if you share your code with uh, programmers who don't know necessarily the language, 
So they can still read it. It will be a little bit more challenging, but they, with uh, some effort, they can understand and uh, grasp like how it works. Now, if you share it with a non-programmer, so probably the code will be like this, like a code something like coming out from the matrix movie program. So the alternative is to share with uh, the executable. So if you share the, the compile executable, so that's great. Uh, your collaborator just can click it, run it, and you will have the output, which is great. And you can have uh, on the side like a report explaining the introduction and the interpretation. So, but if you share the executable, it doesn't show like how it works and you have a lack of transparency, like how it works, the mechanism and your code. So it's true that even like if you share your source code, not everyone can grasp like actually how it works. So that's where Jupyter comes. Basically Jupyter's uh, will combine your code, your output, and all the notes that you want to uh, share with your uh, audience or collaborator. So it could be like the introducing the introdu uh, introducing like the, the data, explaining the, what is your problematic, uh, explaining your analysis. You can uh, also like take part of the code and uh, put like explanation of how it works. And of course, you can show like the, the visual, which is very important. So just like to have a brief look of what a notebook can looks like. So I will just go like I found uh, uh, a notebook on GitHub, okay, which is public that uh, Jeffrey uh, Cantor from uh, Notre Dame University uh, wrote. So it's uh, a recent notebook about modeling and control of campus COVID. So here is just like, a rendering on HTML of the notebook. You can download it on your computer and you can open it with a, a Jupyter interface, but just look what, uh, what a notebook can look like. So you see your text, you see introduction, what he's talking about, the, uh, the variable. So here it's about like using um, a model for uh, the, COVID, uh, the COVID spread. So here, the people who know Python will recognize the code of Python. They may be like able to read it. The one who doesn't know, uh, they can skip it or run it or try like to understand. Uh, actually, the, the author could like put like a cell inside like the different uh, part of the program to explain like what different part is doing. So, but you prefer like to write it like as a comment. And that is the output of the code. So like if I run it, the, the exact same notebook, that's what I will get. And here you can have like your interpretation, more explanation, your, uh, your sources uh, and so on. So that's what uh, a, a Jupyter notebook uh, rendering like uh, you, can, uh, you can get. So to summarize, uh, Jupyter notebook is uh, it's an open source web application. Okay, so when you open it on your computer, it will use your browser like Safari, uh, Chrome, uh, Edge from uh, Microsoft, like could be also uh, Firefox or Mozilla. And it in one single document, you can combine your explanatory text your live programming code, that is important. Like it's not static, it's just not like a copy paste of your code. It's like your code that can run, that you can modify in life. And you have all the visualization and you can add to the notebook like multimedia resources like widgets uh, or videos uh, and, uh, and more. So now, we know what is a notebook, but how to open it and what are our support, our interface, like to, uh, to work with your notebook. Well, Jupyter offer two kind of interface. The Jupyter notebook interface, which is like the, uh, the first one, the classic one. So we will, we will show you later. So it just like open uh, a window in your uh, browser where you can, uh, look for uh, browse in your uh, computer uh, a notebook 
click it and launch it. So it will open a new tab where you will have a notebook like a little bit similar that uh, I show you before with like all the, the menu of the, the notebook. So the Jupyter Lab is a little bit different. It's like the next generation of interface of Jupyter Notebook. It gives you more the feeling of an, an IDE. An IDE is an integrated development environment, like RStudio, for example, or PyCharm. So I would say a feel like because it's not like a full feature loaded IDE. But in one window, you will be able like to browse, like in your computer, open file. Uh, you can have mini tabs or windows inside just one window. And also, we will uh, show it to you. So now about the kernels. So we know now that Jupyter is an interface that allow you like to uh, write the text and write the code and share it. So you have your programming language. So here I just give like some example, Julia, Python uh, and R, but there is many more that Jupyter uh, can support. And you have uh, kernels. Kernels, they are processes, programming processes that will interface, interact between your Jupyter and your programming language. So basically- just, uh, what, Quick yes. interruption there, just to explain where the word Jupiter comes from. You might oh. think based upon the, the, that's not the planet Jupiter, but there's a good explanation, Craig. Yes, yeah, so uh, the, the word Jupiter, actually there is two references to uh, Jupiter. There, the first uh, references is uh, the Julia, Python and R, like the Ju, Pi, R, Jupiter. And uh, also it was reference, the references to uh, the notebooks of Galileo were discovering the moon around Jupiter. So referencing to, the, to his notebooks. So that's where the idea come from of uh, Jupiter. And uh, uh, so, yes, so basically the kernels will, uh, will give like the, the, the the interaction between the, those uh, language and your interface. So you can, every time that you open a notebook, every time you will uh, launch a process, a kernel. Uh, if I launch a notebook using R, so I will have a RR kernel in the background. Uh, if I open another one, I will have another uh, kernel and each kernel contain all your workspace, meaning like your variables, uh, your data. So uh, the, the, there is some way, but uh, we'll not cover that today, but it is like independent workspace. And you can also open simultaneously like a kernel with uh, iJulia or uh, Python or other kernel. So, uh, well, uh, before like to uh, install or Python, uh, uh, Python, Jupyter uh, on your computer, you can have like the chance like to try it. So actually uh, you can do it like right now if you want to. Uh, uh, we will, uh, first I will talk about the first link. So if you go to the Jupyter uh, website, okay, uh, on try Jupyter, you will have the occasion like to try or Jupyter notebook with Julia or Jupyter notebook with Python or R. So I will choose like Jupyter Lab, uh, the Jupyter Lab interface. And uh, here, uh, when I say Julia, because there is the, the kernel will be installed for uh, this particular uh, Jupyter. So here we'll have like uh, Python, I think C, C++ and R uh, kernel. So when you open it, it will open in the cloud, but actually, the what you see here, it's exactly like what I could get like if I launch it from my computer. So here you have access to uh, some data. So in this uh, space, you have like to browse what you have in this directory, though that is the root. Uh, here uh, in the launcher, uh, when you start, uh, it can propose you to create a new notebook using Python or C or R. If you have other languages, they will appear here. Uh, you can open the cancel also, and I, I will uh, show you. You can uh, open a terminal to have access uh, to your computer 
or run some bash command, you can create a, a, new, uh, a new text file or create a, a, a markdown. So what is a markdown file? So for those who are not uh, familiar with a markdown file, uh, so basically you, you can go like write markdown on Google, you will have like the three uh, first uh, link. I think they are very good. So markdown find is a lightweight markup language in the sense that uh, if I click it here, you have like some basic example. It's a very easy uh, and very basic uh, text processing uh, language. So let's say that in your text file, you write like your title and you put like a hashtag. That's when you render the, the markdown file, that's how it will appear. So uh, there is like different uh, notation, like for example, if you put an asterisk, uh, you will have uh, between uh, here you go, two asterisk and your text, it will be bold. And if you put just one, it will be italic. So you have like different way, uh, like to uh, load uh, images or uh, links and so on. So it, it's very uh, straightforward. So let's go back to uh, Jupyter. So now uh, in Jupyter, you can open also PDF. You can also open even like uh, HTML. And uh, you can also open like your data, your uh, CSV data. So when it open it, it will read your uh, CSV data and it will create like a spreadsheet uh, with all your, uh, all your data. Here you go. So that is your data you can go through it and you can have like a peek of what, uh, what you have. So I just want to show you also here, basically here it will, the memory will indicate like how much memory do you use with your uh, Jupyter and how many uh, that are, it's your maximum or basically what is all your system using as a memory and what you can use. So uh, I will open some notebook. Uh, okay, so let's try this one. This one is a notebook uh, for Python. Uh, in this notebook uh, for Python, uh, we'll see we have like codes of Python and here that are the text. So the text, when I double click, you can see that is what I was talking about, the markdown file. So I can here, I can change here, when, basically when, when I create a, a cell, I can decide if I want like a code. So the code uh, will be like in Python here because we choose the kernel Python, which is here in the, you can always see which language do you use. Uh, and here in Markdown, you can create like- Gregor, your Gregor, could, yes. could you increase your screen size? Um, oh, sure. Challenging to make sense of this. Keep going. That's, that's about the minimum. One more would be better. All right. Yep. There you go. That's good. Uh, all right. So uh, here, like for example, like I told you before, like you can change this, so it, this will be bigger, and uh, so on. So that's how you will create your your uh, your text. Um, so like now, if I want to run, uh, I can run cell by cell, like Shift Enter, or you can click on the cell, press play, or I can decide like run all of them, like uh, it will run all of it. And uh, here it asks me if I want to save uh, one figure because here it asks you if you want to save it and it will uh, show you like the, the output, the, the, the visual that you, you ask. So you can open the uh, uh, R it's, it is the same. So here there is no text. And the same way I can uh, I can run it. So we can here now we use the R kernel. Uh, so here that's another example of uh, Python where we have more text. So here in the tab you have like a table of cont content. Like when the notebook is very long or very big, that is shortcut like to go from one section to another. So basically that's uh, depending uh, the, to the header, like uh, if you have like a bigger header, it will have like uh, uh, the, the content here. You can show like actually like the, the part with the numbers 
uh, you can include also the text if you want to in your table of content, or you can include the, the code if you, if you want to. And you can include, of course, everything if you want uh, to see everything. Uh, so I said that you have also the, the opportunity like to open a console. So I can here, I can create a console. It will tell me what language do I want to use. Let's say that I want to use the R console. Uh, this I don't need anymore. And here I have my console. I can drag it, put it here. Uh, and now I have my console and here I can like type like uh, like if I was in an R console in uh, R Studio or whatever. So uh, another the, uh, nice thing it's the contextual uh, help. So the contextual help will allow you just to click on one function, and like for example, if I click here, it will directly give me the help. Okay, of my uh, function uh, head. So this is with R. So, but if I open like uh, uh, a notebook with um, Python, uh, I don't know which function, let's say, let's try this one. It will give me uh, like the help and the, 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 the description of the function. So that is very useful and is very uh, straightforward. So you can also like manipulate your window and put it like as you want. So that's why you have more this feeling of being in a, in a IDE. So the other uh, way that you can try notebook, and I want to show it to you, it's using a collab research uh, by Google. So what it does, basically uh, you go with, uh, you can log in with your uh, Gmail account if you have one. And uh, here uh, it will give you like uh, an environment to use Jupyter Notebook, but you will have the Jupyter, uh, the collab, uh, collaboratory interface of uh, Google. Meaning like, for example, let's say that uh, like, let's try to go uh, in, um, oh yeah, it is this one. So like one of the previous uh, series of our webinars, uh, Shona gave like uh, an introduction to QTL mapping and he used like a uh, notebook. Here you go. So that is in uh, GitHub, right? So it is public, you can have access to it. So remember I told you that this is just a rendering. So you cannot like run it if you have like the, the output, the text. But now I will copy paste uh, this notebook. I can go to uh, the Google Collaboratory. I can uh, upload it. So I will say it's like from GitHub. I will paste it. All right. And now it will load the notebook. Okay, so it will be saved in my uh, Google Drive. And uh, actually, uh, the, it's very similar. So here you can see that is the markdown, the way to write like your, uh, your, 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 your text. And uh, you have the, uh, the code here. So if I want to try like to run it, Okay, I will run it. And here you go. You here because the first time that I open it here. So it's telling me that, well, you don't have the library uh, QTL. Well, uh, that's not a problem. I can open a cell for code. So because it's a R, uh, R part of notebook using a R. So I will use like the command install package. Like it give me directly like how to do it. I can go. Uh, our uh, QTN package. All right. And make it larger again, Gregory. Oh, sorry. Yes. That's good. All right. So I will run it. So it will install the QTL in your library. And the good thing about it is like next time you, you save it and next time you go back and you open it, it will, uh, it will remember that uh, you use uh, this package. 
So when it is ready, you can uh, go and run actually uh, those, uh, those uh, all the, the notebook with all the, the code and you will get like the, the output. So there is like a, a pro version of that, of course, where you have like uh, more uh, resources, like more, uh, more RAM or this, you have access like here uh, to the terminal. Uh, but anyway, like just for free, I think it's a great tool like to, uh, to try on um, <clears throat> the, the notebook. Here you go. And here I can run that. And now uh, here am I, I can run all the codes and I have it. So you can of course save it. You can also share it. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a great uh, tool to uh, explore notebook if, uh, if uh, you're not sure to install it anyway on uh, your computer. So now I will let the stage uh, to Shonak, who will give you like uh, uh, more features and show you uh, how to work more with um, with the, the Jupyter notebook. Uh, Shonak, I will stop share my screen and you can uh, take over. Thanks a lot, Greg. Gregory, that was that was terrific. Um, I just I just wanted to interlude a brief interlude and just to say that what everybody's looking at, and we have 34 participants now, uh, minus Shonak and I guess 32, um, is that in my opinion, this is really the first compelling post-Gutenberg way to publish science. Up, you know, from Gutenberg to today, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, where it's, you might as well have been using an ancient printing press to do your science. The internet provided a great alternative nearly 30 years ago, more than 30 years, about 30 years ago. And we still haven't really caught on. Um, but now with Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Notebooks, we can really get beyond a mere storytelling uh, that we could read to our children sitting on our laps uh, our children, instead of having a, a storybook, will be able to actually work with the data in the next few generations. And Jupyter Lab makes that possible. Yeah, that, that is true. Yes, uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, so I, I'll show you just a few examples of how we use it uh, in our group. Uh, and I want to say that everything that we are going to show you will be in the, the repository that Laura is maintaining for these webinars. Uh, if it is not there already, it will be there uh, in, you know, in a few days at, at the most, maybe later today. Um, so this is, these are the materials for, for today. And I'm going to show you a few kind of use cases. The first use case is, uh, uh, is uh, let's say, literally a notebook. And this is, uh, this is not exactly what has happened, but it is inspired by a, what I might call a consulting interaction. You know, somebody comes to us for advice on some statistical analysis. So I, this is a, a made up scenario, but you know, this is something that clearly could have happened. So I'm, you know, uh, making run, putting my notes into a computer like this Jupyter notebook. And it has these two simultaneous purposes. It has the purpose of like writing down my notes. And it also has the purpose of uh, explaining to the client, you know, certain things like how does power and sample size behave. So here is uh, here are my notes. I'm saying client wants to conduct a two by two factorial experiment in mice. The two factors are the strain uh, and diet, uh, and the outcome of interest is insulin levels measured uh, in the serum. And the client wants to know how many mice they should have in each group and how the data should be analyzed. The client has plans to collect data with many more strains uh, and with a more diverse array of metabolites. And I think there are probably people in this audience who could who can relate to these, right? So, uh, you know, so I made this note and then I wanna also maybe show them 
how power and sample size work. And so I, I, I have pre-written some simple functions to calculate power and uh, detectable effect size in, a, in, a, in an experiment. And uh, so, you know, here is a very simple power function for uh, a specified mean, you know, normally distributed mean uh, with a, a alpha of point zero point zero five. I write the uh, function and I write another function to calculate what is the detectable effect size with 80% power with 5% test, you know, quick, you know, these are probably I would have, I would write ahead of time. Um, and then I, I want to show them uh, how they can visualize power, you know, so here is, uh, you know, there are two groups normally distributed, one with mean mu zero, the alternative with mu, mean mu one, and the standard deviation is say one over 20. I have a, uh, significance level of uh, 0.05. So th this is probably not news to anybody, but you know, if, if anybody in this audience, but I, I could make a, a figure that looks like this. And uh, they, and I can say, okay, you know, if you make the alternative mean a little bit higher, then what will, uh, what will happen is that, you know, the, the mean will shift to the right and therefore your power will increase because your critical region is the region in blue. You know, if your data falls in the blue region, then you will say, you know, P less than 0.05. If the mean is bigger, then chances are very high that it will be, uh, it, it'll be in that region. If the mean uh, alternative mean is a little bit lower, then the mean shifts uh, and uh, it, the chances are a little bit lower. The pink is the region uh, under the, the, the probability uh, under the alternative that it will fall on in the, your rejection region, the critical uh, re significance region. So they can, uh, you know, they can put in their numbers here and I can tell them, uh, okay, you know, if you want, you can enter whatever is reasonable for you and you can visualize for yourself how things are behaving. Maybe this, another piece would be the standard deviation, you know, the greater the sample size, the smaller the standard deviation, and they can visualize for themselves what, uh, what happens and how it works. I can also make uh, other notes, you know, I can make, a, I can write a, a this is my the table of the design. This is the factorial structure. I can explain to them uh, what the uh, how the main effects of strain and diet would be defined, how the interaction effect would be defined, and I can also write for them the analysis plan. And I could give this whole thing to them, uh, and I can uh, you know maybe for their grand application uh, I can plot their uh, minimum uh, detectable effect size as a function of the number of animals. Uh, and you can see here the square root behavior of the minimum detectable sample size. So, you know, maybe if you want uh, effective uh, detectable effect size of about one standard deviation, then about eight animals is okay, you know. So, uh, if I, uh, so this is, and I can share this with them. So they can they can see, and I, I can also make notes. A quick note on how the uh, back end behaves. So this is what the markdown looks like. So this a single hash mark is a, 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 the header. A double hash mark is a section heading. You know, um, here is how the this uh, these tables. This is what they look like. So they are very lightweight, very easy to, to write, and yet the display looks reasonably nice. Now, if I wanna get a little more fancy, I could do an uh, interactive version of, of, of exactly this code. You, know, you can see that this is not a whole lot of code, but I can make an interactive version. And here is what the interactive version would look like. And I made it for you. It, I just have to have a little more code here than, uh, than that. Actually, uh, not even this, I don't need this. 
um, and I can make a, this is the same code, but I, I have with just a little bit of extra code, like here, this, and this, this is the, basically the main thing I have added to the previous notebook. And I can make it uh, interactive version. So you can see a lot clearly, uh, you can, instead of typing the numbers, you can see what happens, you know? So as I decrease the mean, the power decreases. As I decrease the standard deviation, the power increases. Uh, as I decrease the alpha, the power decreases. As I increase the alpha, the power also increases. You know, so it, it's an interactive version of the same thing, very lightweight, very easy to do, um, all in this uh, Jupyter notebook. Now there, so I have covered with you uh, a notebook case. I've covered with you uh, how to make an interactive version of, of a simple visualization. Uh, let me share with you what we do for our courses. So this, for, for example, is the website for our course that Gregory and I teach. Uh, this is an introductory R course. By the way, the, what I showed you in the previous uh, notebook where, uh, was a notebook in Julia, you know, so. So let's say, so these are our, uh, uh, this is our class website and each of our lectures is actually uh, a Jupyter notebook. So for example, this is the uh, linear regression um, lecture and this is a, this is the rendered version of a Jupyter notebook. So this is not dynamic, but this is a static version. The students, uh, so this, this basically looks like a website with a, a lecture and it gives me the freedom to write everything I want to say. Uh, and the students can listen to the lecture, but they can also, uh, have a written version of everything that I wanted to say is written and they have a, a, they can refer back to it. They can either look at it, the, this, uh, the static version, or I also provide them uh, a, a downloadable link uh, for uh, here in these, uh, here in the, uh, in the list of uh, lectures, they can go and download the notebook they want and they can, um, like for example, this one is the, uh, they can go and uh, download the interactive notebook if they want to actually interact with it. So finally, what else can you do? Um, here, uh, let me show you one more. Uh, this is the, the notebook that Gregory showed to you earlier. This is actually my the first lecture that I uh, that that we had in the webinar series on QTL mapping, and this was also a Jupyter notebook. Now, this you, if you want, you can export it in various forms. You can, if you want, you can just export uh, a slide version of this notebook. So, you know, if you look carefully, each of uh, this whole talk is divided into slides, you know, so these are each, each of these will become a slide and then you can give a presentation out of that. Or if you want, you can uh, download an HTML version, which will look just like what we are looking right now. Uh, or you can uh, download a PDF version. You can download just the R, R code inside it because here I have uh, a little bit of uh, example code if maybe you're not interested in the, all the notes I have, you just wanna look at the code. So you can just export uh, that as, uh, as our code. Uh, you could also, if maybe you're not interested in the code, you just want the text piece of it, then you will download the, the markdown version of the code, which will give you just the, uh, the notes piece of the lecture. Uh, and uh, I think Gregory uh, has a, a one, or, one or two more use cases that he will uh, show you later. 
So it's, uh, it's very flexible. I find it very easy to use. I can share uh, whatever I have done with somebody else. And uh, it's, it, I find it an excellent learning tool because people can take uh, what, you know, what we have and uh, they can, you know, often a, a great way to learn is to see what other people have done. And this is a, a great place, great tool to see what other people have done. And then, you know, uh, you know, a lot of us learn by imitation. You look at what works and then you tweak a little thing and that way you get comfortable with it gradually. So over to you, Gregory. Thank you, Shanak. Uh, Uh, okay, so the one more thing that uh, we want to to show you. Uh, <clears throat> so it is like um, it is. Uh, oh, first I want just like uh, still active. Yes, uh, here it is uh, like what is it's just like some uh, piece of uh, his notebook that he, he show you, and there is an extension, and I will talk about the extension. So there is an extension. Uh, it's called SOS, and uh, basically uh, you open your notebook like with the kernel SOS, and here you have it like the, the, the logo and the kernel SOS. And this is a great feature because it will allow you in one single notebook to have multiple languages in the same uh, document, meaning like, for example, here I have my... Uh, uh, my uh, R notebook, I read my data. Uh, I did, I, for example, I do my histogram in R. And uh, okay, I, I take like the, the phenotype of this data. And now I'm using Julia. So now here I can change here in each cells what actually languages that I want to use. So, and you can have like. Uh, a lot. Uh, so here, that is Julia. I will run it, and here you go. So this is Julia. Now I can mix uh, different languages, and that is a great feature because sometimes you have like a package in one language that you want to use. You don't want necessarily like to use like a package that you will call the language inside the language, but just like go directly use R. Okay, now I need. Python to do this, I will do that. So it's a, uh, it's that it's a really great feature. So this, uh, it is uh, uh, an extension. So here, uh, oh, I need like to reload. Okay, let me. If you don't use it for a moment, it will uh, just uh, shut down. So I need to relaunch it. So uh, the extensions, they are like packages, libraries for Jupyter for to use like extra features. So some of them, they are supported by Jupyter. Others, they are not supported uh, by uh, Jupyter, but you can install it like uh, manually. So that's where you have it. So that's, okay, enab enable. And that's where you have like those one are installed here. So let's say that, for example, I don't know what is this. Uh, okay, give, let's give an example like this. For example, you can see like, is there an extension that directly allow me like to uh, to use uh, integrate GitHub, Git versioning like in my Jupyter? And here you go. You have this. So if you click on that, it will go like where you have the. The, the extension and uh, here they will show you like what are the requirements, how you can use it and how you can install it in uh, your Jupyter. So most of the time you have like just a press button like to install it and uh, it will uh, install it for you. 
it will uh, create like all the environment, like adding the, the, the button, the, the, the menu for what you need. And to able to use it, you need like to relaunch, to rebuild like uh, your Jupyter. You just like log on and uh, relaunch your, your Jupyter. And like this, you can have your extension. So let's talk about the installation now. So the installation, uh, so to install Jupyter, basically I think is not very uh, tricky. It's, uh, if you're familiar with uh, terminals, so you can install it with Conda or uh, pip, uh, and uh, that is like straightforward. And here, you you, that's will install like in your environment, like the interface of uh, Jupyter. And you remember I talked to you about like the kernel. So now we need like to install the kernel inside the language. So here there is a kernel list of all the languages that you can use with Jupyter. So there is like 40 of them. Some of them, they are redundant, but uh, it's uh, like a pretty uh, uh, large options. You have, uh, you have, of course, you have R, you have Julia, you even have SAS. You have a version of kernel for using SAS. If you have it on your computer, you can have uh, Stata. There you go. Uh, you can have uh, even MATLAB. So when, uh, and you have, yes, and you have uh, R, so, but I have the link for the R kernel here. So when you click on the, the, the here, the, the kernel, you will go to a page where it will explain to you how to install it. Like, for example, if you want to install in R, you, you need to go to R inside the console, not in R Studio, yeah, just like the pure uh, language. Uh, that's for R anyway, uh, and you install the kernel called IR kernel. Uh, so you have it here. Uh, you have sometimes notes like for people like using uh, Mac, uh, they tell you like just to be careful like uh, from where you launch your R and be careful about the path. So, so the kernel can see the path of your the R and the Jupiter. So that's where sometimes it can be a little bit tricky, but most of the time you have like nice tutorial and you see it's like few line of code in your R to, to, to install it. Or if you're not very uh, savvy with uh, terminal uh, command, well, there is Anaconda. So Anaconda, it's, uh, you, you, you can have it like for Linux, uh, Mac or Windows, and it will take care of for all the managing your uh, libraries and uh, packages that you need like to install uh, Jupyter and, uh, and Jupyter Notebook. So uh, you can go to Conda and uh, you will have here product uh, individual edition, it is free and you choose like which one do you want and uh, it will be uh, uh, very uh, straightforward. So uh, yeah, I would like, like to, uh, to conclude, uh, I don't know if you will have time, maybe after the, some questions, so to show you if you want more examples or more uh, publishing website where they, they use, uh, uh, Jupyter notebook. But the ben main benefits of using Jupyter uh, first is like the, the choice of the language. So I mean like notebooks, the idea of computational notebooks is not new. Like I think the first one who used like computational notebooks was the Mathematica. And uh, you can have like in now in R, you have like R Studio that have R Markdown where you have like a kind of a notebook, but you don't have like this live interaction. Uh, you can have, like I show you, like uh, Stata, SAS, uh, Python, even C, C++. So even like non-scripted language like can have, can be used with Jupyter. Uh, the other benefit is the live 
interaction with your code. So like, for example, you want to present something or even like you want to share a notebook, someone wants to change, like just change the input and run exactly the same thing without thinking about like what it's doing. So it's very interactive and it's very user-friendly. Uh, so the notebook sharing, so I show you like how we can share it on GitHub. Even people who are not uh, Jupyter, they can go on Google, uh, Collab uh, Google, open it there. So uh, there is very easy way like to, to share. You can just mail it. Uh, you have like the interactive output, like the widget that Shonak uh, show you. Uh, and for me, that uh, I think it's uh, it's a great tool for uh, teaching and for prototyping. Like uh, when I I start a project and I want to get familiar with the data or get familiar how I will just uh, analyze it, I open my Jupyter and I go directly like from one line code to another. You have directly the feedback that is really great. But like if I want really like to develop like a package uh, or a big project, uh, I will still miss like some features like in uh, IDE, like a debugger. So actually right now, recently they uh, provide the debugger for Python, but you still don't have a debugger for R or for Julia. So little thing like this, uh, can 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 miss. Um, the other thing is like uh, when you do like your Jupyter notebook, you see that there is like some cells, and you can see like every time you run one, two, two. So so it's incremental, you know, incremental uh, uh, running uh, code. So if you're not paying attention, it is true. Like if you change something earlier and you rerun and you forgot, you change it meanwhile and you run it. You have to be be careful about like the order, like because you can run it like not necessarily from the top to the bottom, but you can start by the middle. So there is like the second sequence of execution. Execution. Uh, you have to be careful about that. Uh, you have also be careful about from where you launch it. I mean by that like one of the first thing is like <coughs> when um, when uh, students they use it. They launch it and they say, oh, I cannot find my folder. Because basically, when you launch from a specific uh, place, uh, what will happen, I can give you a, a quick example. So let me see if I can clear. So let's say that I launch it in from uh, my uh, terminal. So here, I am in the directory C. In subdirectory of bigger, bigger yeah. directory, bigger, 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 oh. bigger. Uh, okay, so this I don't know how you I will make it. <laughs> Let me try. No, no. I, I'm sorry, <laughs> this will not work. Okay. But anyway, so you have like a directory, and if I do like Jupyter, I will launch it like this, launch it like this, Jupyter Lab. Okay. So you see like it's C, Git, blah, 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 blah. But when I launch it in my Jupyter lab, uh, okay, I will not have access like directly from my file browser to whatever file which is higher in the hierarchy of my uh, folder, you see? So that's where I can go. I cannot go like uh, I cannot go higher than that. I know that is like in C blah blah blah, but I cannot go to that. Or you have to open it like this, open from path, and you have to write like uh, all the path. So that is like a little bit inconvenient. So for that, uh, to avoid that, like when you run it, what you can do, you just and that's what I do. You can go like directly from uh, the root of your drive and here you will have access to, to everything. So that's like the little uh, limitations. Uh, and the other thing is like for the extension. So I told you there is a lot of great extensions, 
but some of them, they are very straightforward. And some of them like to maintain the extension, there is a little uh, learning curve. And by that, I mean like, because if you are not using necessarily an extension that is supported by Jupyter, when Jupyter uh, has an upgrade, an update, it doesn't mean that the extension that you are using will have the update ready at the same time. So sometimes there is a lag of uh, one, two months, few weeks, I don't know. So, and that can uh, be uh, also sometimes a problem. So I want to thank you all for listening to us. Uh, and I encourage you like to go and explore uh, Jupyter. Uh, we give you like uh, the link. Uh, we will post like all the resources uh, in uh, GitHub. And uh, I think we are ready like to take uh, any question. Yeah, and, uh, and please feel free to ask us questions here or even later. If you have any questions, if you wanna reach out about anything related to Jupyter, uh, we'll be glad to help you out or at least try to see if we can help out if we cannot you know, if, if it's something that's beyond our capacity. Questions? I have a question. Okay, go ahead. So uh, my experience actually with Jupyter uh, Notebook and Jupyter Lab is pretty much the same experience they had with supercomputers at Oak Ridge. So it means that when your program is pretty much developed and ready and you want to just get yeah, tested on, for example, a data set, then this is, these two platforms are good. But when you are in the development stage, pretty much none of them are going to be great choices for your work. Uh, so uh, I also found yeah, this uh, Jupiter as uh, more of a teaching and prototyping or exploration and show and tell actually, and mm -hmm. not, a, a really a platform for developing your program. So this was my experience at, uh, of these two actually that just wanted to share with you. Yeah, I, I think I, I, I would agree. I think, uh, I, or I don't know what Gregory has to say. And I, I, for when I'm developing, I use Emacs. <laughs> I'm yeah. not using Jupyter, but what, what, whenever I, I will say this, that whenever I have to take notes, like, you know, as I said, like a consulting meeting, Correct. Uh, as you say, and as you say, show and tell, <laughs> it is very effective. Right. Uh, I have to communicate, uh, or if I have to give somebody an option to change things, then it is, uh, it is really helpful. I, I, I would agree, concur with that. Gregory, what do you think? All right, so actually, I mean, actually, when Jupiter, like the first Jupiter, like the Jupiter Classic was launched, it was not made, like the idea was not made like to be like a development environment. You know, it was more like, like I said, like to, to have a notebook and share uh, with an interactive code, which is already developed, right? So I, I, I agree with you. But now with the Jupiter Lab, which is the next generation, the both are still like up to date and they were working. But in the Jupyter Lab, that's what they are pushing now. So it's a work in progress. There is a lot of things yet to reach like the stage of like a full IDE, like for to, to develop. I agree with you. Right, right, yeah. So, and when I say like it's good for prototyping, it means like, for example, like sometimes what I do, uh, I write like, let's say that, uh, let's say that I want to write like a, a function for, a normalization or something like this. I can write my function like like I will write like in uh, in my atom or visual code like in in a cell. And when I feel that when I'm ready, you know, like to really like to start, I can reuse just this code that I wrote. Like Shonak said, you have an option like to export just the code, and the code is just like it would be a .gl or .r. And then I move on to my development environment, like you said, like where it is more, uh, I think like robust and more, uh, you have more uh, facility and uh, yes. So right. I, agree with you. I agree, but I think that in the, in the future, Jupyter Lab, what they aim is like more like to be a full ID, but they still have like some, in my opinion. 
is uh, the something. other limitation is actually versioning and merging assume that a number of people are working on a collaborative project and they create different versions and then i think it's going to be a challenge to just merge those those versions so maybe not ideal for collaborative work uh so for that actually so we had exactly this problem with shonak when we were working on the R classes. So let's say that I was working on a notebook. I, I put on the GitHub, like the notebook, it changed it. I couldn't reopen it. It was like messy. There was like problem of merging and behind, you know, it's like, yeah. So that is true, but they, oh, create, yeah. they created an extension, which is called JupyText. And basically, Jupyter was uh, was made exactly to uh, to uh, solve this problem. And by that, what I mean is like when you create your uh, Jupyter notebook, you pair uh, you pair your notebook with uh, let's say uh, like if it is R, I pair it in uh, R Markdown uh, type file, and that what I will versioning on GitHub. And this R Markdown or any other like uh, pair file, which is not a notebook, uh, there is no problem of versioning of merging. And the, the good thing is like, I can open it back. I can uh, convert back directly in my uh, Jupyter back to a Jupyter notebook. So Shonak, I don't know if you can, that's what you want to show. Yeah, I'm showing that, exactly that. So this is what, the website looks like. So Gregory and I, when we work on our class, we don't send anything to each other. Every, all our interaction, all, even the website that I showed you, everything is through GitHub. So what he does is he will, here are all the pull requests. What he does is he, these are all the, the filters. If I, uh, uh, you know, if there is no, nothing, um, here are the closed. Uh, so here, are, you know, he will send me a pull request with the changes that he has made, and he doesn't send the the Jupyter notebook. He sends the Markdown version of the Jupyter notebook, which is very easy to merge. Uh, I can see the changes. What I do at my end is uh, I will open up the Jupyter lab. I will. It's not here. Sorry. Uh, I will open it up and um, uh, I can, um, I, sorry, it's, it's, I, I cannot show you here exactly what happened, but uh, I will open it in as a notebook, that R Markdown file. I will convert it to uh, a full-fledged Python, no, uh, the Jupyter notebook. And that also gives me a, an opportunity to check what he has done, because if it doesn't work, then there'll be a, a flaw. Uh, and then that is the version I commit and I push to the website, which is what you saw, you know, all those notebooks that you saw, that is the version. So he and I collaborate using R Markdown. Uh, the final version, uh, I convert to a, a Jupyter notebook and I push it to the website. So, so uh, yes, what you said is correct that the Jupyter notebook by itself is very difficult to version and I, I do not version it. Uh, what we, uh, so we version control the R Markdown version, which is a lot easier to see, merge, you know, see the changes. Right, so I, I, can, I can share my screen and I can show what it, uh, what it looks like. So here you go. All right, so th that is the, the lecture. So uh, okay. uh, I will just put it a little bit less like this. So when I double click here, I have my notebook. All right, so this is a lecture about like factors and uh, using Jupyter, I, uh, Jupyter text, I paired like in the R Markdown style. So actually when you do it, you don't necessarily uh, have uh, to, uh, to do like R Markdown, there is other options. Like I, here I click JupyText. And here I have possibility like to uh, just 
uh, pair it with books with a, 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 a script file like that will be easy like for merging and versioning. So naturally we use R Markdown uh, with R. And so this is a notebook, but the notebook by itself, like if you look at the row, like what is looked like behind, it's like written with JSON file. It's the JSON okay. file. Yeah. So, and that's where when you try to mix it and to write it, like it can be like, uh, it can be problematic. But the R Markdown file here, and I will open it. So it's ex exactly like uh, R Markdown, you see? So it can be open actually in our studio. And let's say I don't have this one and here I can just delete it. Okay. I can delete. All right. But with this one, because it was paired, I can open it back as a notebook. And that's how uh, Shanak is doing on his hand. You see, and in a moment, when I save it, it will recreate like the notebook here. Oh, okay. so, yeah, so basically without JupyText, yeah, it will be so challenging and it will be very difficult like this. So, so this is a great get around. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. yes. <laughs>